The axiom of completeness and the axiom of transitivity. In the last video, we say that a consumer's pairwise preference over any pair of objects, called them A and B, is simply a specification of which of the following four statements is true. We then define the consumer's preference over a set of objects to be a complete specification or description of her pairwise preferences over every possible pair of objects in the set. We consider the example of Jane, who was facing a set of three objects. We say that from this set of three objects, we could form three possible pairs of objects. We then give an example of what Jane's preference was over this set of three objects. We say that she strictly preferred dog to egg, strictly preferred dog to fish, and was indifferent between egg and fish. This complete specification or description of her pairwise preferences over each of the three possible pairs of objects is precisely an example of her preference over this set of objects. We can now state what the axiom of completeness is. We say that a consumer's preference over a set of objects satisfies the axiom of completeness, or more simply, we say that a consumer's preference over a set of objects is complete if she never ever has none of the above listed as a pairwise preference. In other words, whenever she's given any two objects, call them apple and banana, she always picks one of the following three statements as true. She strictly prefers apples to bananas, she strictly prefers bananas to apples, or she is indifferent between apples and bananas. She never ever answers none of the above. We can think of the axiom of completeness as a restriction or an assumption about what preferences look like. In particular, by imposing the axiom of completeness, what we are assuming is that the consumer, whenever she's given any two goods, she can definitely say for sure which of these three statements is true. She either strictly prefers one to the other, or she's indifferent between them. She's not allowed to say that she has no opinion, or she's never heard of what an apple is, or give some other answer. She must always choose one of these three statements as being a correct description of what her pairwise preference over this pair of objects. So is this a reasonable assumption to make? Well, on the one hand, it's not always true. For example, it might be that Jane has never tasted an apple or a banana in her life, and so she genuinely has no opinion whatsoever about apples and bananas. But for the most part, these sort of situations are kind of unusual. For the most part, whenever you give people two objects, they'll usually be able to tell you whether they strictly prefer one to the other, or whether they're indifferent between them. And hence, even though this axiom does not perfectly describe the world, it is nonetheless a reasonably good description, and so we might be happy with it. Another reason for imposing this assumption is that we believe, or at least economists believe, that rational people ought to have complete preferences. That is to say, when you give a rational person two objects, he should be able to give you a definite answer as to whether he strictly prefers one to the other, or whether he's indifferent between the two of them. Yet another reason for imposing this assumption is that it simplifies our analysis of how people go about making choices. So altogether, we've just listed three reasons for imposing the axiom of completeness. Perhaps you're now convinced that this is a reasonable assumption to make, but maybe not. But in any case, we are going to go ahead and maintain this assumption for the rest of this series of videos. Throughout these videos, we are going to assume that everyone's preference always satisfies the axiom of completeness. We'll now talk about a second axiom, that's the axiom of transitivity. It'll probably not surprise you to know that if 7 is greater than or equal to 5, and 5 is greater than or equal to 3, then we can conclude that 7 is greater than or equal to 3. More generally, we have it that if a number x is greater than or equal to y, and the number y is greater than or equal to z, then the number x is greater than or equal to z. We say that the greater than or equal to relation satisfies the axiom of transitivity. Similarly, suppose that whenever John weakly prefers the object x to the object y, and he weakly prefers the object y to the object z, then we can automatically conclude, without being given any more information, that he also weakly prefers x to z. In this case, we say that John's weakly preferred two relations 
satisfies the axiom of transitivity. Or more simply put, we can simply say that John's preference is transitive. So previously we've already said that henceforth, we'll assume that all preferences satisfy the axiom of completeness. Now we're also going to add that we'll assume henceforth that all preferences always satisfy the axiom of transitivity. Let's again have a brief discussion about the axiom of transitivity. Just like the axiom of completeness, we can think of the axiom of transitivity as a restriction or an assumption about preferences. And just like before, we can again ask the question, is this a reasonable assumption? Well, it turns out that it's generally regarded as a much less reasonable and much more objectionable assumption than the axiom of completeness. One reason being that violations of the axiom of transitivity are quite often witnessed in the real world. Let's consider an example. Suppose I ask John, would you rather go to Paris or to Rome for a vacation? And he told me, huh? He'd rather go to Paris. And I write down his response, he'd rather go to Paris than to Rome. And then I ask him a second question, would he rather go to Rome or to London? And now his response is, oh, he would rather go to Rome. And I write down his response also. And now I ask him a third question, would he rather go to London or to Paris? And he tells me, oh, he'd rather go to London. And I write down this response also. So the three responses that he just gave me, they don't sound altogether unreasonable, but yet taken together, they actually violate the axiom of transitivity. Should we now conclude that John was somehow being irrational? Maybe if we confronted him with his choices, he'll get embarrassed and he'll change his mind. Maybe he'll now say that, oh, you know, actually he, he would rather go to Paris than to London. But then again, maybe not. Maybe he'll give us perfectly good reasons about why he made each choice. Nonetheless, as we've stated, henceforth, we'll always assume that everyone's preference is transitive. There are two good or perhaps not so good reasons for making this assumption. One, we, or rather economists, believe that rational people should have preferences that are transitive. And two, making this assumption will make our analysis of how people make choices much simpler.